Thank you all. I was very much looking forward to this because I'm hoping that you can help me to understand how to better interpret what I'm, uh, the material that I want to sh uh, share with you, you guys. I mean, I kind of follow silently a lot of the online conversations and am learning a lot about how people from different disciplines approach similar problems. Um, just as a little bit of background, how I got involved in following the Cuban blogosphere really came from my own area of study, which is performance, because I began to note um, in around 2009, and especially in 2010, wow. that uh, the um, kind of expressions from of opponents in Cuba, opponents to the system, had taken on a very kind of media savvy and performative character. Um, and part this was due in large part to the fact that in 2008, all of the restrictions were lifted on ownership of cell phones in Cuba, even though they are very expensive. Um, and that has enabled a lot of people who consider themselves to be non-official artists or independent journalists or citizen journalists or activists to use the phones not only to send uh, text information out, but to send videos and photographs of themselves in direct confrontation with state authorities. So as a result of that um, media presence and that immediacy, I argue, at least as part of one of the arguments that I make in the book that I'm working on, that, uh, that suddenly the dissident in Cuba became, in a sense, a kind of performance artist. Um, but I thought what I could do today is to uh, try to give a more broad presentation to understand why um, use, in, use of independent media is so controversial in Cuba, um, but also why it gets so much attention outside Cuba. Um, because considering the small size of the Cuban blogosphere and the kind of in independent media culture, it gets a disproportionately high amount of attention in U.S media, and particularly from the United States government, which has a vested interest in um, exploiting the presence of the, of the independent uh, Cuban bloggers. Um, so, and that was, is what I think makes this situation somewhat different from some other contexts that I have also uh, looked at in Latin America. Um, is the, the, um, the vested interests of the US government and the economic involvement of uh, USAID in creating uh, this blogosphere. But anyway, um, so, uh, so something just to begin, just to give you know, this is just a, a picture of a kind of graffiti that um, the latest uh, strategy that is uh, being employed by a, by a lot of um, dissident groups is to try to plaster their message on uh, on the street, since getting not most people don't have access to phones or the internet, um, and so they've kind of taken up this stylized form of graffiti that is then uh, you know reported on by committees for the defense of revolution and for the, and and uh, taken down or painted over, and this battle goes on uh, back and back and forth, back and forth. But if you just walk by it as a visitor in Cuba, you might think that the general population is demanding um, access, free Wi-Fi access. Um, so it's important to understand that this com com Connect Cuba campaign that it is a part of is funded by this uh, Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba, which is one of the top um, uh, recipients of USAID money. Um, so uh, just as I was uh, preparing this PowerPoint, uh, Eliezer Avila, who is a dissident activist and a former computer science student, um, and Operación Verdad agent uh, published this in Diario de Cuba, Cuba, which is one of the online daily blogs that functions like a newspaper or like an opposition press. It's based in Spain. Um, they get money from the National Endowment for Democracy, um, but they uh, don't sort of come under the radar of critique from the Cuban government so much because they are located um, outside, right? Uh, but he published this uh, thing about, you know, what is public debate like in Cuba today? And basically, his, these are his talking points um, that, you know, officially orchestrated public debate. The problem with it is it all happens in Havana. There's no video documentation, so exposure to it remains limited to those who are present. Um, the, there's uh, no 
forum in official Cuban media for any sort of debate about political issues, only about sports. That's the only thing that's debated in uh, the dailies and on television. Um, the attendance to these events is by invitation, and it is not, it doesn't represent a broad spectrum of the people in the, in the population. Um, you have to show your, in, in a way, it's a kind of symbolic thing, but you're, you're not really supposed to speak unless you can demonstrate that you have a certain professional authority to do so in those contexts. Um, there, he talks about the rhetoric of in, um, or the rhetorical strategy of, of being um, intentionally obfuscating issues to prevent people from actually getting to the point. Um, but on the other hand, if anybody in the opposition organizes a similar event, they're harassed by state security. And uh, government officials don't engage in debate on the issues. So that's how he outlines that's the problem with the official public sphere as far as he's concerned. Now, he's a very interesting figure. He was a computer science student in Havana who in 2008 stood up in a public meeting with Ricardo Alarcón, who was the head of the National Assembly at that point, and started kind of pointing the finger at him and asking about restrict contradictions that he perceived in uh, government position on civil rights and press freedoms and so on and so forth. And this was filmed but with a, a cell phone and put on YouTube and became a really famous confrontation. Um, he was also, he did not identify himself as uh, this at the time, but at that time, he was working as part for state security as part of something called Operacion Verdad, or Operation Truth, where um, students, computer science students, were uh, sent into the Cuban blogosphere to essentially troll and harass the independent bloggers and to try to discredit them. So they fill up their comment uh, uh, spaces with negative commentary, dispute every single thing they say, and basically just try to um, make a more pluralistic debate extremely difficult, if not impossible. And in 2000, I think it was 2011, he um, came out as a spy uh, inside and uh, was interviewed by Ioanni Sanchez um, and told the story of what uh, Operation Truth was and has since uh, kind of been reborn as a dissident um, who uh, says that he wants to make a new political party and so on um, and so forth. So he's a, a very uh, interesting case. Okay, so here are some key dates. This is all stuff that's fairly recent. Um, as you know, you know, Cuba has very, very low connectivity in relationship with other countries in the hemisphere. Service begins in 1996, but I remember that service. It was extremely limited and extremely slow, um, mostly at hotels and um, ministries. Um, in 2003, uh, after the imprisonment of 75 journalists, I should have said independent journalists and activists, um, that basically shut down what had been a very small uh, uh, milieu of kind of independent journalism, print journalism, that had existed before then. Um, and so any kind of uh, dissident publishing activity begins to move to the internet. Um, at that point. Um, in 2006, you have a major shift in uh, power with Fidel Castro stepping down and his brother taking over and claiming to be the economic reformer. Um, in 2007, uh, what explodes uh, is the first major online into conversation between public intellectuals about cultural politics. Uh, this is known as the Pavon case. Uh, Luis Pavon was a basically a, cult, a commissar um, in the first five years of the 1970s before there was a Ministry of Culture um, in the really kind of height of the Sovietization of Cuban cultural politics when culture was run by the uh, Communist Party and was responsible for um, really basically blacklisting um, most famous uh, intellectuals and writers during that time. And then he kind of disappeared from public life for a long time and suddenly there, there's a television show on Cuban TV in 2007 where he's brought out and lauded, and this sparks a debate among uh, many, uh, an intergenerational debate in emails, because most Cubans who have access to the internet only have access to a Cuban-based email. Um, but the discussion quickly got out into the diaspora about what it meant to rehabilitate um, a, a figure like that who was so hated, right? 
And uh, what's interesting is it was the first documented public conversation in which exiles, dissidents, opponents, and people who considered themselves still working within the power structure as members of the artists and writing were fighting it out and fighting out a leg over a legacy um, from the 70s that for some people is a convenient way of saying that's when repression existed and now things are better. But a lot of the conversation became about why the silence had been maintained about the persistence of this kind of repression. So what that, uh, that conversation eventually spilled over into public events in Havana that were restricted to members of the Artists and Writers Union, and this uh, produced a very negative response from younger people who couldn't be included, who uh, are then galvanized to uh, start to generate a blog a, a world of blogs where they can have a more open conversation about things. So bloggers start to meet weekly, OK? Um, and then in 2009, Yoani Sanchez, who is the most famous uh, of all the Cuban bloggers who's won all these awards and is now has an endowed position at uh, Georgetown and is running a paper from inside of Cuba, begins what she calls her Blogger Academy, which she uh, holds in Havana and also takes on the road to different provincial cities, in which she basically teaches Cubans how to use WordPress or how to use Blogger. We're not talking about very sophisticated programming here. It's very, very basic. But we're talking about a world in which only 10% of the population has a landline at home. And you know there are uh, now, I think, a million and a half cell phones in Cuba for a, a population of 10 to 11 million, depending on whose uh, figures you follow. So, um, But she starts this academy. And then another uh, uh, blogger, Lisabel Monica, who is now a graduate student at Princeton, started uh, a website called uh, Taza de Café that was basically a how-to. Like, how do you do, you know, given that you have very uh, uh, like slow dial-up service, how do, you, how do you deal with the tech problems that arise from this for people? Um, and at that point, uh, this is also the cell phones are now easily much more easily available. At least there are not as many, le there are no legal restrictions on obtaining them. So the problem then becomes simply a financial one. Um, this is what causes the Cuban blog blogosphere to explode. Un this was unanticipated by the government. And so it took them a few months to figure out that they had a problem on their hands, a political problem on their hands. And the response up to this point has been to launch official blogs to counteract the influence of the, inter, of the independent blogs um, in outside the country. And at this point, the number of the ratio of government blogs to independent blogs is two to one. But the readership of the independent blogs is far surpasses those of the official blogs. OK, so um, general problems about connectivity. Um, well, first, what's the political problem is that the internet is seen as a threat to national security by the Cuban government, and that um, the internet is uh, a pro-democracy imperative for the US State Department. So this is what pits the two countries against each other. Um, and it also what cre uh, generates all the money from USAID and other US government uh, initiatives to support the um, uh, use of technology. Some of you, uh, the digital technology, and uh, get increasing internet access. Some of you may have read the story about Sunsuneo that broke um, on AP last summer. I'll get to that in a little bit. But that is a kind of um, uh, crystallizes what a lot of these uh, uh, ongoing programs have been about. So the Cuban government's methods for restricting ac internet access, they don't, it's not China. They don't just say you can't get, you know, Google is inaccessible, or you can't have a Gmail account. It's done in a much more. Um, in a, in a less kind of categorical manner. So restricting bandwidth, censorship of sites that are critical of the government, prohibitive costs for most Cubans, um, and the criminalization of certain kinds of communication. Right. So those are the main restriction methods. Um, and then there's a problem of the sort of debt access, right? that how few people have landlines, how few people have cell phones. And at this point, internet access is estimated at 25% penetration. But that f it is very, I would dispute anybody's ability to come up with an actually really accurate figure because so much internet access is done through the black market. Um, and there's no way to measure um, how many people steal 
service from hotels, how many people rent service from foreign students, um, or you know any of the other means. How many? I mean, I, I suppose the government could track how many people buy foreign phone service packages to access with data packages to access the inter internet from their phones, but it's very difficult to measure these things. Um, most internet is, uh, you know, an in-country email system, um, and, and to get. A, an account. Up until now, you've had to basically be the member of a, a union, like the Artists and Writers Union, or um, access through your workspace, uh, through your workplace, or if you're a student, access at the university. And so that gives the government total control over how much or how little uh, you can do. Um, the company that uh, controls this is called Etexa. It's the, the the Cuban telephone company monopoly and the cell phone. Part of it is called Cubacel, and the new um, internet packages that are available, well, not a package, but the internet access that's available to the population through the cyber cafes is called Nauta. Right? Um, some of you may have heard about the case of Alan Gross, which is another part of the cyber war. Um, he was, he's a guy who's in, been in prison in Cuba for the last four years. He's serving a 15-year sentence. He worked for a company in Maryland um, that had a USAID contract. Um, and he went, made five trips to Cuba, um, not always masquerading as a tourist. Uh, and he was bringing in uh, a, the kind of equipment that, frankly, most people I know bring into Cuba to give to their friends and their families, you know, computers, phones, and so on. But um, he was caught uh, with a mobile phone. Some of you may know, I don't know what this is, but a mobile phone chip that makes satellite transmission undetectable, which apparently you can only get from the Pentagon or from the Department of Defense. And that was the thing that the Cubans needed to be able to nail him um, at, you know, for a kind of espionage. So uh, he was uh, arrested, I think, uh, well, He's been, he's been in for four years, he's been in prison. I think he was arrested in 2009, tried in 2010, if you could call what, they, what you get there, a trial, um, and is serving the sentence. And there's been this ongoing conversation about whether or not to swap him with the four Cuban mm -hmm. spies who are still in prison in the United States for having um, been lurking around Miami looking for anti-Castro activity. Um, and this is still an open question. OK, so a little bit of background on how things got so heated um, is uh, that uh, some of you may recall that in 1994, there was a huge rafter crisis um, in Cuba with 35,000 people uh, leaving on these makeshift boats. In, and um, you know, many, 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 I, as, mu as much as a third to a half of the people who attempt to leave probably died during that time period. And that is a constant, because this is continues to go on. But the crisis produced a shift in US policy on Cuban immigration. Up to that point, anybody who left was going to be taken as a refugee. Now we have the wet foot, dry foot policy, that you have to have a foot on dry land right, in order to be given a ref refugee status. And otherwise, you're returned. So um, as part of an attempt to try to save more lives, some groups in Miami, well, a group in Miami that called itself Brothers to the Rescue, started flying planes over the Florida Straits and uh, to spot people and then tell the Coast Guard to go and collect them. And they flew into Cuban airspace in 1996, and the Cubans shot down uh, two planes and killed a bunch of people. And that was the event that enabled Jesse Helms to get his uh, Helms-Burton Act passed in Congress to tighten the US trade embargo and to um, begin um, massive funding for um, pro-democracy uh, uh, projects in Cuba. That was, this had been deba the, the, the bill had been debated for several years, and this is what got it going. So um, you know, as a lot of it is about tightening, um, tightening the restrictions and <coughs> being able to take foreign com third country companies to court for um, engaging in commerce with cu Cuba. Uh, but uh, the most important thing for the internet and information is this issue of the funding for broadcasting to Cuba. So this includes the pro-democracy money for groups on the ground and things like uh, uh, Telemarti, which is the big TV and radio station that operates out of Miami, totally at the, um, you know, on the bill is picked up by the US government.
Okay, it is treated by many news outlets in the United States as if it were a regular news agency when it is in fact a government operation that is now largely manned by former employees of Cuban television. Okay. So Cuba's response to this is to introduce Law 88 into the Cuban Penal Code, um, and, which is a very long look, but the most important part, part is that if you can be found to be guilty of uh, spreading or reproducing materials received from the US government that supports the objectives of undermining the Cuban government, you go to jail, right? And you go to jail for a long time because it's a, considered, these are considered treasonous acts. So uh, m m the uh, 75 people who were arrested in 2003 were arrested using Law 88. Okay, and here it says it's pris uh, up to prison sentence up to eight years. That's what it says on the law, but most of the people in 2003 were given 20 to 25 year sentences. Okay, so uh, the more technical questions about access. Service continues to be slow. It gets, it's getting better. Um, I used to just get up and walk away from hotel internet centers because I'd pay $8 an hour and just wait for one picture to download. Um, it's getting better, but it's still very slow. Um, <coughs> hotel access is now at about $6 an hour, so the price is going down, and you can buy these cards that can reduce the price slightly if you buy a, a large number of hours. Uh, the new cyber cafes for Cubans, the rate is about $4.50 an hour, which is a lot, um, especially if you take into account what the average salary is, which is about $20 a month. Okay, um, cell phones have to be paid for in hard currency. It's about a dollar for each um, SMS. If you use MMS with pictures, it's about two fifty. Um, you know, basically these prices are prohibitive for most Cubans. Um, so if you have a cell phone there, you're more than likely just to use it for texting, and that's it. Um, and uh, more recently, now email accounts are um, now you can have, have get email on your phone if you have a phone, but still no access to the web. OK, uh, and this means that um, basically the diaspora pays for the phones. You know, there's $2 billion in remittances to Cuba every year. There are several, I mean, it's not all for cell phone usage, but uh, <laughs> It, uh, you know, there are many websites that are maintained both in Miami and in Cuba that allow people who want to charge to pay for cell phones to do so from abroad. And most activists have a, a, a pay button attached to their websites and their blogs that allows you to uh, donate money to charge their phones or to charge their phones directly. Um, it is a common uh, request that's made by activists uh, to people in exile is to charge their phones so that they can continue to send uh, news outside the country, okay? Um, but everybody does this knowing that everything is monitored. Uh, and if you work in, uh, let's say you work for Granma or you work for Juventud Rebelde, if you work for one of the, an, an official news outlet, you, um, or any other workplace, you must submit whatever you're going to post for approval before you post it. So there's no, there's no independence if you're working. Dissidents are able to put a little bit of their stuff into the paquete or to make their own paquete. And so to sell for two COC, COC which is the Cuban version of hard currency, um, you know, when you come in from outside, you have to change all your dollars to a Cuban hard currency, and the government takes a cut off the top, right? And uh, so two COC now is more or less about $2, but once upon a time, it was more, more like $4. Um, now, it's, now it's down to about 2 So uh, that's not, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but again, you just have to keep in mind how little money people make. Um, so, but, but they're used widely, and then there are private uh, game parlors that people set up in a room in their houses, and uh, uh, and that's where the youth go to to play. Okay. Um, what as far as if you are somebody who needs to use the internet for your work, okay, whatever your work may be, um, or if you're somebody who you've decided you're going to be an independent journalist. Uh, or you know, you just are not going to work through state channels to do whatever you do. Your options are um, you can rent time on foreigners' lines. There are a lot of foreign students and foreign technicians in Cuba, you, less than there used to be, but they're around. They can have internet in their homes, and they will charge 
much less than the hotel rate, maybe half the hotel rate. So you might be paying $3 an hour instead of $6 an hour. So there are people who I converse with regularly who'd say, um, I'll be able to chat with you on FaceTime on Mondays between 3 and 4. And that's their time. Okay. Uh, another way is uh, to uh, steal Wi-Fi access outside hotels, especially around the tourist areas. There are a lot of really sharp teenagers who know where they can put laptops in the, the vicinity of a hotel lobby and, um, and take some of the Wi-Fi from there. And then they'll, you know, if there's a, an access code, they'll get in bribe employees to give them the codes. Um, and then there's uh, the uh, more expensive way, but the most effective way for activists is to purchase foreign phone data packages and SIM cards. So countries like Switzerland or Spain that have a substantial amount of tourism to Cuba will offer these data packages for people traveling to the country. We can't do it because American cell phones don't work because of the, 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 the trade embargo, right? But so I know activists who have people outside the country who finance, buy them the data package, and that allows them to have internet on a phone, right? Uh, and that's that. Not everybody. That's a, that's expensive, but it's probably the best way to go, especially if you are worried about your own safety. Um, because I don't know if you heard about this uh, uh, activist Osvaldo Paya, who died in a mysterious car accident in 2012. He had shut off his phone, so as not to so so that the GPS wouldn't work. Um, but that also gave the Cuban government 12 hours in which to have him die and have no way to. <coughs> trace what happened, right? So um, those are the way. Now, what do they call hacking? You know, because I mean, I don't, I have not been able to find anybody who says, oh, yeah, I hack into the Ministry of Interior system, and I go in the back door, and I know the code. For them, hacking is really retooling of machines, right? Um, so they do, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that bring you cell, cell phones into the country. There are a lot of also just traffickers of goods from the states who make a living go going back and forth to function as a wholesale supplier uh, for people doing independent businesses. And they bring lots of used uh, cell phones um, and smartphones into the country. They ha those have to be altered to be able to work on the Cuban phone system. So you know, I've gone into backyards of uh, people's houses where you have six or seven guys there pulling apart phones and getting them to work, and also uh, pulling apart uh, PlayStations and Nintendos to get them to work without um, having to use uh, the whatever it is that you need from here, whatever <laughs> software you need. Uh, so um, they also modify apps that are for online to work offline to help Cubans. And um, every single bit of software that's used in the government and outside the government is cracked software. So you know, people who know enough about this stuff, either about the electronics or about uh, computer programming, are making a very good living right now, adapting everything for Cuban use. Okay? Um, there is also something called Revolico. Uh, a website, which is the Cuban version of Craigslist, and it's totally illegal, but um, it's thriving. And basically, you can buy anything, you know, any kind of Apple equipment, any pro computer program you need to edit, um, any, you know, the latest iPhone, or a house, or a car, or anything else on Revolico uh, by uh, answering ads on, on Revolico. So those are the, uh, that's the retooling. So who are the bloggers and the artists who use all this media, and what are they doing? Um, so they're mostly blogging, doing citizen journalism, political commentary. There are a lot of literary publications, um, because Cuba's ability to publish has diminished uh, greatly since the uh, withdrawal of aid from the former Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of coverage of human rights activist activities. So that's uh, the, the Voces Cubanas is probably the most uh, best known portal um, that was set up by Ioanni Sanchez in 2009 and hosts a number of different 
blogs from people inside uh, Cuba. And uh, Havana Times also runs a lot of commentary from a lot of different bloggers uh, on the island and is uh, translated into many languages. They're linked up with volunteers outside the country who translate a lot of this into many languages, mostly into English, um, I would say. And, uh, but like Sa Ioanni Sanchez's page, Generation Y, is translated into 14 different languages daily by volunteers, which is really quite, uh, an, quite a feat. Um, that's always subject to um, a lot of speculation by the Cuban government of, you know, this must be an indication that she's a spy. Okay, so here's Ioanni, the best known uh, blogger, and um, with her blogger academy. And uh, I, I will say, you know, for whatever criticisms there may be made of her, she has been quite generous in sharing her knowledge um, and her tech resources with others. I mean, she really wants, has wanted to create a movement inside Cuba and not make the whole thing be all about her, although she's the Times, you know, 100 most important people of 2008 and, um, you know, gets to meet with Joe Biden and so on and so forth. But she has, she does run these academies. She does collect equipment um, and flash drives for lots of people. And she has succeeded with her a husband, uh, Reynaldo Escobar, who's over there giving a talk at the academy, um, in uh, starting the first online newspaper that comes from Cuba, which uh, began uh, this year. Okay. Um, some of the other things that started up as a, you know, in terms of how uh, Cubans are trying to help each other using blogging is this uh, uh, Lisabel Monica's kind of tech support online. It's like their own little internal conversation about, um, you know, how do you get around the fact that you have so little connectivity? And then um, the legal advisor, Laritza Diversant, who has offered her services for free to dissidents to help them and to get out of jail, to deal with police detentions, and so on and so forth, but also to provide people with um, up regular updates in uh, changes to Cuban laws uh, so that they know what limited rights uh, they have. Um, so uh, how did they get started with all of this? Because Cuba has lived for most of the last 54 years in a total information blackout, right? Uh, uh, starts with blind blogging. So send, uh, you know, when people just couldn't even get into a hotel to um, access uh, the internet to uh, put their posts up. They would blind blog, so send SMS texts to friends outside the country and have people outside maintain the site. So you have these telephone game style chains, for example, of prisoners in jail calling relatives when they get their weekly phone call, having the relatives transcribe by hand their reports from inside a prison that then gets typed up by the family member and taken to a blogger who converts it into 140 character SMS messages that are sent outside the country to Spain or Sweden or, or New York and then posted on a blog, right? That was the, the old uh, way of doing things. Um, then uh, Ioanni began to teach people about uh, how to use email addresses to send data directly to Blogger, Twitter, and YouTube. But also she gave people the, I think it's an HTML code, to be able to do MMS from a Cuban phone. Because um, that was key. That was being able to do MMS meant they could start to send pictures. Uh, and that really changed the nature of journalism especially in the United States, journalistic coverage of Cuba, because they started, uh, American outlets start to use data being sent from Cuba by these independent journalists and bloggers, OK? Um, so the Cuban government begins to fight back by f uh, flagging Cuban blogs to get them taken down or to flag them on flag Cuban bloggers who are posting to Facebook. So they got into the game with this kind of hostile reaction. But then Lisabel taught people how to de um, to disable that function so that they could get back on to Facebook or um, be able to uh, restore 
uh, their blog to use. Um, so the main challenges that these uh, bloggers and independent journal, uh, journalists have is that it's very difficult to build a local base. Um, the Cuban government is very much more concerned about controlling their access to a local public than they are about controlling their access to a foreign uh, public. Um, so just to give you an, an example, uh, someone from this group, Estado de Sats, was in New York last week at NYU, and I was moderating a discussion, and he was talking about how uh, they made, the group made a documentary about acts of repudiation, these kind of public excoriation of, of dissidents. And they were able to distribute 500 DVDs in movie theaters in Havana, but they have over 300,000 hits on YouTube. Okay. Now, most Cubans cannot watch anything on YouTube. So most people watching outside are outside Cuba. Right? But that's the, the, that, I think, is a, a relatively accurate measure of the difference in their capacity to uh, disseminate their message. Um, there are the legal obstacles. Um, that are created by the Cuban government. I mean, you can go to prison. So far, since 2003, I don't know of cases of people who are going to prison for blogging, right, or for being en engaging in independent journalism. It seems that the Raul Castro's ver approach to this is to try to de um, to destabilize them through less uh, harsh means. Um, to attack their credibility, um, to, 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 uh, to describe them as mercenaries, um, and so on and so forth. So there have been some you know, very uh, aggressive skirmishes with police and uh, detentions that have lasted a few days. But overall, the bloggers are not going to jail en, ma en masse the way that the independent journalists did in 2003. Um, there's this total dependence on pro-democracy funding from the US, largely because we're still in a Cold War world when it comes to Cuba. And it's very, the, the, the world outside Cuba remains very polarized as to you know, whether, whether this kind of blogging is in fact um, you know, a mercenary activity or a, a destabilization project, or whether it's a project that is uh, merits um, you know, being taken seriously um, and treated as autonomous from the financial source. But this is, uh, there is this problem that there's no gray area in this. Either you take the money from the US or you can't do it. Right? And in some cases, it's unclear whether the activists are even aware of uh, the original source of the money because these, uh, this money is funneled through allied states through Poland, through the Czech Republic, through Sweden. Um, and also, uh, it also comes through foundations in the US who don't necessarily make uh, it so known um, you know, what it is, what money they're, what they depend on. Um, there's, uh, OK, there's an, another dimension to this, though, is it's not necessarily, it's not all about blogging and activism. It's also about giving unofficial cultures, unofficially recognized cultures, a chance to flourish and to have a way of disseminating their information and um, building audiences both inside and outside the country. And in that sense, all of this kind of um, connectivity through telephones and through embassies and these um, indirect means has really helped to uh, for example, the, uh, the publication of this magazine, Bolsis, um, that publishes all sorts of literature, poetry, and commentary by uh, writers who don't come through the official channels. So they haven't graduated from the University of Havana with a degree in philology or literature. They may come from the hard science. The, the editor uh, was, a, 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 I think, a, a biologist in Cuba before he became a fiction writer. Um, so but this is, gives an alternative means of, of publishing literature. That's been, it's been very important for this. It's also been very important for artists who don't have official recognition from the Artists and Writers Union. Because up until very recently, if you didn't have that membership, you could, first of all, be denied the right to travel because you didn't have professional status as an artist. And uh, beyond that, you could have any public event of yours shut down because it wasn't being channeled through official institutions. 
So uh, being able to have a, an ongoing online video diary has served as a kind of protective <coughs> shield, but also as a kind of online gallery to exhibit. And so these guys, you know, they even document their whole sort of final um, a, a, uh, acquisition of visas to travel in 2013. And this is after their having been, having been working as artists for 17 years uh, without any official uh, recognition. Um, there's also a lot of independent film production going on uh, because of this media that is now uh, distributed via online sources. And a lot of it deals with subjects that cannot be treated by um, the Cuban, within the Cuban te television system or the official Cuban film industry. Uh, uh, Eduardo Del Llano, who also works for Ikaike, but he makes the films that he wants to make on the side. This piece, Monte Rouge, is about the visit of two security agents to the house of an intellectual. So it's not something that you're going to ever see in a Cuban film, right? Uh, this uh, documentary by Ricardo Figueiredo about rappers is all about the politics of rap in Cuba, which is maintains a very kind of oppositional position vis-a-vis um, -vis the government. Um, and again, would not you would not find material like this on TV. Um, and uh, rappers are almost entirely dependent. Uh, rappers with political rap are almost entirely dependent on this kind of independent distribution. Um, probably the most famous case of a musician whose career yeah, is entirely dependent on the internet is this uh, uh, rock, punk rocker Gorky Aguila, who's been arrested twice, served four years in prison between 2003 and 2007, I believe, on trumped up drug charges. And um, is this kind of, you know, the most famous enfant terrible of the Cuban music scene. Um, comes to the United States very often to perform for audiences of up to 10,000 or 15,000 in Miami. Uh, distributes his music via internet and is totally banned inside the country. Um, but is very notorious, been the subject of BBC documentaries and so on and so forth. Um, and uses the vid video diary motif or method as well to protect, to shield himself from um, more police harassment. So the second time he was arrested, he actually didn't have to serve a prison sentence. And I do think that it's because of the media attention outside the country. Um, so the cyber battles, I mentioned uh, Operacion Verdad. And there's Eliezer confessing to Ioanni and here talking to, questioning the president of the National Assembly in public in 2008. These are things that nobody outside would have ever heard about before, were it not for um, this kind of emergent uh, blogosphere. Um, and, uh, and then you get the kind of parodying of official media. So you have Granma, the official newspaper of the Communist Party, and Wama. Uh, the parody of the newspaper being produced uh, outside the country. Um, and you know, for the first time, the Cuban government finds itself unable to maintain hegemonic control over the image of what's going on inside. Uh, and then you have these blog dailies um, about Cuba that are uh, 14 Medio is Ioannis, which is based in Havana. Cuba Encuentro is based in Spain, like uh, Diario de Cuba. Cubanet is in Miami. And, but they're, they, they base themselves there, but the contributors are largely from the island, right? And Café Fuerte is uh, also based in Miami. And these are all um, now, you know, they're blogs. I mean, they're not official newspapers by any stretch of the imagination, but they represent what would be an opposition press, right? And they're quoted by wire services and CNN in Spanish and Fox Latino and so on and so forth. Um, the direct line to Washington is really clear because all of the reports from these bloggers end up in uh, basically entering the American media through fear through these uh, channels. And, uh, and then, but you know, when they talk publicly, Everybody who comes from the island stresses the importance of the exile community's uh, support. And it is relevant. It is significant. I mean, there's $17 million in USAID money. Something like 80% of that stays inside the United States. There's $2 billion of Cuban remittance money every year. 
So it's far more, um, you know, financial weight of the remittances is far bigger than uh, the USAID. Um, but so some of the means that, uh, that uh, these exile uh, community support groups, uh, some of the means of support is um, recharging cell phones. Um, this group, uh, Roots of Hope, which actually started at Harvard with Cuban students at uh, Harvard several years ago, um, they uh, uh, do a lot of technology donations. So they gather, use cell phones, buy flash drives, um, and bring them. They, or they help to organize uh, dissident tours in the US. They've organized um, uh, kind of, how do, how do you call it, copycat protests um, in Miami that mimic uh, 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 activists uh, events inside uh, Cuba and so on. Yagruma is the um, Cuban version of Kickstarter that was started to support independent cultural projects, but um, it got stopped in 2013 by the Treasury Department because of the trade embargo restrictions. So it's in hiatus now. So Coco, just yes, so we have to stop. We've got about 25 minutes left, so it really is a question of how much. Food okay, food. well, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So these are the <laughs> Cuban Money Project is uh, uh, run by Tracy Eaton. It tries to analyze the financial part of this, uh, like where the money's going, the USAID money, um, and uh, that's also in hiatus since 2013. Uh, this is the the Twitter controversy, the Sunsuneo that you know, depending on whose version of it, it's either a destabilization program, or it's um, helping uh, the Cubans, or it's just totally ineffective. And um, then just at, at the end, these are the, some example of some of the official blogs. Um, they don't have to pay, so that's their, they don't have to pay to access the internet. They can get on from work um, without any uh, control on that. Um, their goal is to foment debate, but their content is restricted. Um, they're supposed to adopt the persona of the reformer within the system. So you have like the gay official blogger, right? The young student blogger, right? Um, and uh, they, but they have learned how to move information into news threads to challenge uh, the independent bloggers. Um, and then there are some that just devote themselves exclusively to um, counterattacking, uh, uh, counterattack to go, going after the dissidents. Um, so I think I just want to give a couple of examples of activism that wor has worked in Cuba using the internet. Uh, there's this group called uh, the Red Observatorio Critico, um, and a lot of their work is uh, ecologically oriented. Um, they're not so much interested in publishing in. Uh, the Huffington Post, they're interested in kind of social practice, community-based activism about uh, getting people in Cuba to understand uh, what the threats, ecological threats are, um, because it is an extremely kind of debilitated biosphere um, at this point. And uh, the most successful, I would say, uh, international activist campaign came from 2010 around the death of this political prisoner. Um, Orlando Zapata Tamayo, where uh, activists inside and outside Cuba mobilized together to combine street action and online action to pressure the Cuban government to release the other political prisoners that were still in prison in 2010 from the ones who were arrested in 2003. And so this included copycat marches in 36 different cities around the world, all sorts of petitions, and a hunger strike by Guillermo Fariñas that lasted 135 days. Yes, it was not his first. Um, and it produced the release of the last 50 political prisoners. Um, right now, this is the other campaign that's going on, which is uh, about getting uh, 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 Cuba to sign agreements on human rights with the United Nations. So sorry that went on for so long, but as you see, it's kind of complicated. Um, so I'll stop here so that uh, we have some time for questions. <clears throat> and I, I see we already have questions queuing up, and I, I, I think what you're going to find is there are some people here who know Cuba reasonably well. There's a lot of people here who know parallel media environments where there are similarities and differences. And as someone who's sort of studied online censorship for the last 10 years, it's really interesting for me to sort of think about what sort of the different phases we've seen of online censorship. So. There have been sort of three books written by a, a group of people who study censorship. Um, 
the first was access denied, and this was sort of the, the first version. Either you, you weren't connected to the internet, right. or you censored very heavily. Um, and then there was um, access controlled, and this was really a theory of um, did you turn off access at particular times? Did you shut down connectivity before an election? Where there's certain sites that would go off, but others would be open. <clears throat> and then the most recent paradigm in this has been sort of access contested. Right. And this is where stuff gets really interesting. This is where you have counter bloggers coming online. This is where um, you have services run either with co government cooperation or with very strong government oversight, often with blocking other services out of there. And what we've seen through most of the world is this sort of gradual move from sort of where Cuba was of sorry, you're not going to have access to this, to, look, of course you're going to have to have access to this, but it's going to be a very complicated space. Mm -hmm. And part of what's been so tricky about this is the debate over how one deals with speaking in this space, looking for creative speech, looking for political speech, looking for artistic speech, often hasn't caught up. So you still have people, you know, trying to basically parachute radios into Cuba. Right. Despite sort of not realizing that, you know, we're a couple of generations beyond that. So my guess is that some of the reactions we're going to get from friends around the table are sort of looking at some sort of parallels in other situations, but mm -hmm. I'm maybe just anticipating what Dahlia wants to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a build on that. Um, okay. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. It's, uh, I don't know much about Cuba, but this is uh, sort of it was interesting to see how there are a lot of parallels and differences as well uh, with the Arab blogosphere, which I've been studying for the past few months now. And uh, I guess it's interesting to see that there were some, ob well, interesting observations that came out of the Arab blogosphere is the fact that a lot of people don't blog anymore, uh, especially political blogs, where it's like, there is no point. Partially, I guess, is because there's a shift to other forms of social media. Twitter and Facebook, mm -hmm. and and another part is this sort of access uh, as access issue, where it's like you have people who are counteracting that um, pro-government forces or other forces that are counteracting that conversation. And I'm just curious to hear what you think. I mean, there are a lot of interesting obstacles or interesting links within the Cuban blogosphere. The fact that this is a lot of it is U.S. funded and have the links maybe with Latin America or not, the rest of Latin America or not. I'd be curious to hear what you think, where this is heading in, in the sense of, you know, in the Arab world, people don't blog anymore. Right. Well, I think that one of the things that I noticed is that very, very few bloggers in Cuba have a sense of the ta blog time of online time of this that that you know in the states everything moves so fast bloggers blog every day right or more than once a day and you know cubans are not used to that kind of speed in anything i mean it takes 4 hours to get to work so why you know when how are you going to do a blog every day there's also much less of a sense of the the um the the tactical use of brevity um, you know, the, the, a lot of blogs are very long, the, the posts very so it makes it difficult for an outsider to get through them and to figure out what's going on. In that sense, Yoani Sanchez has been very successful because she understood the 140 characters as a kind of challenge, right? But she produced uh, some, uh, also blogs in, brief blogs with very vivid, vivid imagery in a very common person's language that made them very easy to translate and very easy to understand outside of the Cuban context. So she's been very successful. I think other bloggers have been less successful at uh, understanding the pace and the kind of ecology of blogging outside the country. Nonetheless, the demand for information from inside is so great you know, uh, that um, they're going to, I mean, you know, there are entity, entities outside the country that's going to draw that information out of bloggers whether they want to give it or not. I mean, that's the, the sense that I get, is that there's a tremendous demand for this information, and there are, there's a machinery in the United States for absorbing it. Uh, so, you know, that, that is going to produce more blogs, um, even if 
it doesn't happen at the speed that we're accustomed to here, just that there is a, there are consumers outside. <clears throat> I think that speed observation is, yeah. is right on because, I, I mean, this has been a, a, a really fascinating space. I mean, blogging sort of comes to the fore maybe 12 years ago. And in a lot of the places we study, it, it died three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really died as Twitter and sort of Facebook took over. And basically, for people who weren't writing essays, but were doing the observational and sort of, you know, what we kind of joke of is like the dopamine blogging. You're just looking for someone to sort of receive the information. That's moved into this much lighter weight media. Mm -hmm. And in the US, at least, what happened was the bloggers have become mainstream journalists in a very funny way. You know, I still blog, but when I actually want an audience, I write for The Atlantic. Right. When you're in a place where there's still so much to report, and where you don't have the possibility of that sort of dopamine delivery system of I put it up and my 10 friends liked it, it seems to me quite possible that it may survive for quite a while because it's the right technology for the moment in terms of, of internet penetration and, and possibly in terms of what the larger... But also there are, there are some among them who are becoming Huffington Post contributors on a yeah. regular basis, or Samsonia Way, or what? So, so there. It, I mean, it's not as fast a process, but it's the, it's there. Well, so so here's an interesting question. I'm going to go over to Jing Wang next, yeah. but um, one other dynamic in this that I think most of us aren't used to thinking about is that the Cuban diaspora in the U.S. in particular, it huge, powerful, it, it certainly influential within U.S. politics clearly sort of involved in some of these dialogues. Not every blogosphere has that same sort of dynamic. While there's an enormous Chinese diaspora, there's far more people on Chinese social media in China, and that has a lot to do with how Chinese social media dialogue gets shaped. But yeah. mm -hmm. Actually, my question is of a different order. Uh, you know, it, well, I know your talk is focused on the digital and it seems that in the digital space, there's so little breathing room for voices of, of opposition to be heard. Uh, but at the same time, there's such a great demand for information, right? So I'm wondering, um, what about the other media, the, the other mediums, underground, print media, which is less easily to be monitored? It's actually more easy to be monitored in Cuba. Here's the, this, right? yeah. It's almost impossible to get a photocopy done in Havana. It's almost impossible to print anything. The enemy propaganda laws that are part of the Cuban Penal Code criminalize publications that are not officially sanctioned. What about underground? Um, it, it, but that's there, but this time. is the problem. Yeah. Okay, so the people who were, just to give you a sense, the people who were arrested in 2003, they were trying to circulate print media. It was really easy to come down on them using the enemy propaganda laws. Okay, they were also um, many of them were independent librarians, so people who would collect Samistat, the Cuban equivalent of Samistat, uh, books on human rights or just uh, books on uh, by exiled writers or writers that were banned in the country, and keep collections to uh, be able to use as references, and also to keep collections of the um, you know underground printing. And you know th that's physical media that's really easy to locate and say, here it is. This is you know this is banned. You have it. You, you're arrested. But it's harder to track the distribution. It isn't. It isn't. It's actually harder for them to deal with the flash drive culture right now. And that's why the government's response to the flash drive paquete has been to sort of go into a whole kind of moral, uh, 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 you know, critis, crit, critique and saying that, that, that this is a, has a degenerative effect on the society of, as a whole to have all this uh, forbidden media circulating uh, through, through the flash drive. So, I mean, this is, the, the thing is that I've been surprised so far that there has been no addition to the penal code to criminalize the digital media because they're, they're not, they're, that has not happened yet. And you know, some people say it's because the leadership is so old, they're just totally out of touch with what young people are doing. But it's, uh, to me, it's very surprising considering how effective the um, laws around em enemy propaganda have been in preventing people from publishing inside. Did you want to follow up? Okay. So, so <clears throat> um, it, it, it's always nice for me when something that I wrote you know, 10 years ago 
has a certain amount of relevance, but I wrote a paper some years ago called The Cute Cat Theory mm -hmm. that argued that the most powerful media in closed societies was the popular media. So going in and trying to set up your special, here's the Twitter that's going to undermine the Cuban government, you know, that, that shit never works. It's too dangerous to play with. It's only reaching a small group of people. The stuff that's actually powerful is the quotidian media. Mm -hmm. It's what everybody is using. And it's really hard to ban because everybody uses it. And so, for instance, for the Arab Spring, what was really powerful was video, particularly over Facebook. Everybody was on Facebook. You weren't going to ban Facebook in Tunisia because you would have had another rebellion on your hands. But that turned out to be a way to get video out. And that video, once it ended up on Al Jazeera, turned out to be very powerful. <clears throat> in Cuba, it's probably the paquete. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the fact that, you know, whether it's movies, whether it's music, whether or not you're slipping the news in there or the activist media in there, in fact, as long as it's got a certain amount of pervasiveness, that's going to become a powerful channel for somebody. Whether it's a channel internally for someone to get dissident media out, whether it's a channel for someone external, I think you're right that probably the greatest threat to this is in some ways having that become too politicized and having that probably become illegalized or really cracked down on at the same time. Um, but it is interesting to sort of see the ways in which local media is sort of rising up to, to meet those needs. Ian, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just a quick question. I'm wondering whether the bloggers who are in Cuba but posting things on sites in the U.S. or wherever, are they using their real names? Are they trackable or is it a pseudonym? At the very, very beginning, there were some bloggers who um, didn't use pseudonyms. And as a matter of fact, there's a woman named Miriam Selaya who is one of the better known bloggers now who, can, who came out at one point and is like, okay, I've made a decision. I'm going to do this using my name. So as far as I know, at this point in time, people who are blogging are using their names. But you know, if you, you go, you, once you enter this world of being a dissident there, you basically move into a kind of gray zone where you experience a, a kind of social death in Cuba. You, you, can't, you, know, you can't get a job anywhere anymore. Um, you, know, you will probably be shunned by people who fear for their livelihoods, right? So they end up in these very kind of small, enclosed uh, subcultures where they don't have a lot of communication with others. They are also subject all the time to being accused of being mercenaries because they they get paid by the nation seventy five dollars or you know whatever. I mean, some bloggers, Yoani gets paid a lot more now, but she's really an exception, right? I mean, the the amount of screaming about how they're all hired hands of the CIA, I find really laughable because mo most of the money from the government stays in the United States to the Beltway consultants and the foundations that are um, you know managing all of this stuff. So they're not making a lot, but they, they might make something or they might get a fax machine or a computer or a cell phone given to them to be able to do stuff. They do use Twitter. Uh, the, the bloggers use twi Twitter. Basically, at this point, everything is all linked. They, have, they yeah. do the, you know, I post and then it goes to Twitter yeah. and Facebook and I'm done, right? And that's economically uh, uh, more viable for them than just having one or the other. And there are some of the more savvy ones who know to use Twitter to protect themselves when they're in a protest. Yeah. Uh, if they're about to be arrested, they have a Twitter message ready to go, and then immediately it goes to Telemarti, and then it goes from there to Fox News and to CNN in Espanol, and the next day they're released from the police station. Yeah. So let me ask maybe a, a, a pointed question on mm -hmm. this, which is you've given, a, <clears throat> I think, a really nuanced but also sort of critical view of, of the US and all of this, which is to say, there's a huge amount of US money trying to come into Cuba. At best, you could argue that it's trying to carve out a digital public sphere that is going to make independent journalism, artistic creativity, all of these things happen. At worst, you could argue that it's an enormous pile of money, mostly going to defense contractors, Beltway bandits, USAID contractors who may be doing more harm than good and who may be endangering everyone they touch. You've got the year of, of John Kerry. You've got five minutes to make a case for what the US does through the State Department in Cuba. 
What do you tell Secretary Kerry on this? Um, well, first of all, that what Alan Gross did was very dangerous, um, and that Zunzuneo is a waste of time. The Cubans are more uh, more uh, adept at figuring out how to use those systems to their advantage. Um, so, you know, I don't think that trying to send, you know, Central American young adults in there, as was the sort of the extension of Sunsuna, is going to be very effective. Um, it's more effective when Cubans organize themselves, right? Uh, on the other hand, I would be much happier with a more uh, a more diverse uh, source uh, sources of funding. In other words, if there were other options so that it wasn't so polarized, that would that, that, I think that would be more comforting. And I think also that it's really important for the Cubans who are inside to not be so um, unquestioning in their acceptance of uh, alliances with organizations in Florida in particular that are essentially uh, rehabilitating themselves through this partnership because these were the same organizations that were sponsoring violent opposition up until the 1980s. And so, but there's no, there's no way to have a conversation about that. Yeah. Um, nobody wants to, you know, and these are like, I don't think I'm the only person in the world who's aware of this stuff. And I don't, I, I also think it's important on the left not to call what these Cubans are doing mercenary activities. Because I don't think that the desire to have independent journalism in Cuba or the desire to have independent culture or temporary autonomous zones where you can organize your own activities is something that was invented by the United States. Yeah. I think that's something that really is a grassroots demand and desire and, that, uh, and to, to equate that with a kind of you know, CIA top-down operation is wrong. It, it's it's an incredibly challenging and somewhat unfair question, and that was, I, I thought, a terrific answer to it. Let's get a couple more questions in. Let's go here. Hi, Gogo. Thank mm -hmm. you for a uh, good talk. I have, well, uh, let, let me ask one question first. How do, how do you approach, um, you talked a little bit at the beginning about the performance, the, the reading of, of, of these uh, distance as, as a, uh, in terms of a performance as well. Um, and it, they're certainly occupying a very vulnerable position, and they're also suffering from credibility. So mm -hmm. how do you approach the issue of credibility um, of these activists, dissidents, and cultural workers in the sense, um, in the way that they're isolated in Cuba? And you talked mm -hmm. about the social death and how it applies. And I'm thinking, going back to the issue of performance and vulnerabilities, who they're writing for and who they're performing for, if they are not received, I would venture, as in the Arab Spring, with the kind of local solidarity, right? They are, people are still afraid to approach them. Mm -hmm. They uh, are subject to... Suspicion. Not everybody, okay, not everybody in Cuba has that much to lose at this point. I mean, the, the era in which the government controlled everything, information, uh, you know, cons the little bit of consumerism that existed, uh, the educational system is over. I mean, essentially, with the withdrawal of support from the for former Soviet Union, the economy went into a tailspin, and that has forced Cuba to take on a more uh, 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 f uh, friendly relationship with the exile community, and also to develop different kinds of alliances, but also to withdraw the uh, force of the public se sector from every aspect of life. I mean, the government can't pay for everybody's food anymore. Um, they can't provide enough housing. Uh, the educational system is in shambles. If you want to go to a hospital, your relatives have to send you the anesthesia to have an operation. So, you know, in that kind of situation, and also where information and media is constantly coming in from outside, the, 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 the kind of totalizing hold that the government had is no longer there. So for some people, they don't really care that much. It's not, nobody wants to go to jail, but it's not like, it's not, things aren't, ideologically, it's not as airtight as things were, let's say, up until 1990, okay? So in that sense, yeah, there are people who don't want to get involved because they don't want to be in trouble, but you don't get the same kind of public shunning um, as you might have at another period of time. You just might you have people just not want to hang out with you, right? Not, not want to be at your meetings and things like that. Um, you know, in terms of credibility, I have to say, I think that there are some 
activists like the ladies in white, who were the female relatives of the political prisoners, who, yes, they did receive training from the US interest section, but they had a real political cause, and I think that they have a real following. Um, I think, and great sympathy, both inside and outside the country. In that sense, I think it has been a very effective movement, and that it would be uh, inaccurate to characterize them as tools of the, the US government. And they got the, they got the prisoners out. So that was a, that's been that's been good. Um, I think some of the others are less known to the public, um, but also that their goals and their interests are less aligned with what the majority population is concerned with. Right now, people are concerned with getting money and getting out. That's it, right? So if you're worried about the political transition and who's going to be in the next government and uh, you know what what's going to happen when Miami Cubans come in and start pouring money into the economy. I mean, for most people who are living there, those are not uh, immediate concerns. So for me, like as some, an observer outside who is concerned about both the you know people's daily lives and the ability of artists to create an independent culture, and what does it really mean for the U.S., which you know embraces authoritarian capitalism all over the world, to be trying to tell dissidents to argue for uh, free speech. You know, I, I worry about it, but I have the luxury of being able to do that from here. I don't know if that's everybody else's concern. So we're almost out of time. I got a couple of hands up. Um, you, can we get a quick question? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about what should the U.S. do in this situation. There, is, there are apparently two paths. The one path is lift the embargo and let the economy boom and let people organize by themselves and maybe hope they will move into the next phase of control or they will get something else. The second path is to squeeze the Cubans and let it explode. Like, like what you said, they have no choice, they have nothing to lose. So if you are an advisor of the Obama government, mm -hmm. what, will you, what will you suggest? Well, uh, the thing is, I don't think that you can just lift the embargo. <laughs> it's right. it, 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 it's what else is what else are you going to do? What how? I think the concern to the United States right now, as far as I understand it, is number one, they think Cuba sends sells secrets to Syria and Iran. That's the kind of political problem with Cuba right now. Num that's number one, and they also are worried about a migration. A ma another mass migration of Cubans to the United States. 22,000 Cubans have arrived in the U.S. illegally in the last 11 months. That's almost as many as during the rafter crisis. So they're not all going on rafts now. They're taking flights to Ecuador and walking with, uh, with uh, smugglers all the way through Central America, through Mexico, into the United States. But that's a lot of people, and the so southern Florida economy can't absorb them. Okay, so those are like real concerns in Washington. The other problem is how many electoral votes Florida has and the political force of the Cuban, Cuban American machine, right? And what, ca what can the US do to Cuba that's not going to upset the political stability of either the Republicans or the Democrats in the state of Florida, okay? So, and you know, the, the Miami Cuban community is divided on what, whether or not to lift the embargo. There are many who say yes, and there are others who say no. The ones who say don't lift it are the Republicans who are probably identified with the older generation, right? The younger people are less interested in the embargo. And, uh, but I just think that if there is going to be a lifting of the embargo, and it, there's also got to be a change in immigration policy and some sort of you know, 21st century, century version of a Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of a country that is devastated economically, not just politically. It, it looks like it's been bombed over and over again in a war. And so you can't just then let, you know, anybody come into the country and do whatever because they'll turn it into the Bahamas, into just like a bunch of hotels. And that's not a solution. That's going to produce more migration, right? Um, uh, anywhere other than other than there which is the situation with most of the caribbean so i you know i see it as very complicated and where the whole kind of human rights civil rights thing 
fits in all of this to, leaves me with a lot of questions because I don't see, I see those issues right now as a way to harass the current Cuban government, but I'm not so sure what the US's commitment is to those things post transition. So <clears throat> incredibly helpful last question. Amazing presentation. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Hugely helpful.